Well, you missed us earlier this week, but it's the Thursday morning edition of Respect yeah. the Process. I'm Kelly Hunter, alongside the voice of Alabama, Chris Stewart, and you're the reason why we uh, my fault. are here because the charter for basketball was leaving on Monday, so we had to get down to Gainesville. We'll talk about that turd. In a little bit, but we've got you covered. Um, I thought I heard you say that. Then yeah, I realized, no, I yes, say, I did. Well, yeah, we'll talk about that. We'll polish it when we're through. Because usually I may, if people offer a, you want to hear the good news or bad news first, I like the bad news, but we're going to leave the bad news for That's fine. later. And we're going to start with, I'm going to say kind of interesting, I don't know if juicy or inter is interesting is the best word, but the Chris Lowe article that came out uh, yeah. yesterday morning on ESPN, uh, it was time stamped 7 a.m. March 6th. And uh, Chris Lowe was the reporter that initially broke the news about Saban's retirement, and right. he released some additional information that, it, 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 I guess if you're interested in Alabama or college football, it's interesting, because sure. Lowe used some really interesting words um, in that article, and, and one was the phrase, when talking about uh, his decision to retire and the way the process began was, reshaped the landscape of the entire sport. Yeah. Because what this said to me was, in reading uh, some of Saban's decision making, how it came about, what caused him to finally come to it, the phrase, no country for old men, was what came up to me. Because in so many of the things Saban was saying, it's he just got tired of having to deal with it. Right. And, and look, I don't think it's, and I know you didn't mean this, but I don't think it is age. I think there are a lot of coaches who are, I mean, Chip Kelly's a prime example. The guy left. Just didn't want to deal with it. The guy left to be a coordinator, uh, now granted a well-paid one, mm -hmm. but he knew it was, he was fighting a, a losing battle at UCLA. It, hearing you talk about those things, though, and I read it, I, I just go back to the contrast, and yet some similarities, to when Coach Bryant retired. Mm -hmm. And I was 12 years old, barely, no, I was still 12, um, read every article I could possibly find uh, back then about what all was going on and then his passing and then Coach Perkins, you know, following him and all that entailed. And I was just, I was struck by the contrast. It's not as if Alabama football under Coach Bryant had fallen off the map, mm -hmm. but it had um, it had dropped. You know, Coach Bryant's last game was in the Liberty Bowl in Memphis. Bigger bowl then than it is now, but still not a major bowl, mm -hmm. not a New Year's Day bowl. Coach Saban played in the national semifinals. Right. And was leading with a minute to go mm -hmm. before that thing flipped, unfortunately. And has left the Cadillac running very, very smoothly right. for a very good driver taking it over. And I thought that was pretty telling in that story mm -hmm. that you talked about with Chris. I always said, and again, Lane Kiffin's a very good coach, really talented, and I think still has a chance to be one of the absolute best in the game by the time it's done of those active now. Right. But handing the keys to that Cadillac mm, he's would gonna, be like he's handing, dig it up. It, it, it's a kid who's going to drive it too fast mm -hmm. and, and mess it up. That's the feeling anyway. Yeah. That may not be fair no. for Lane, but he gave that Cadillac to a very responsible, right. very good driver. And I thought the timeline was incredibly interesting. Right. I've not quite finished it yet. I've read most of it. Uh, I haven't gotten to the very end of that story yet, but I know this much because I know Chris Lowe. It's, it's an accurate one. It's the same way I felt when I got the text, I believe, from you. Is this true? <laughs> it, and, and then you said, who's the article by? I and did. I said, Chris Lowe, and you're like, then it's probably it's, accurate. Uh, yes. Uh, if it's Chris Lowe, it's right. And that's how much respect I have for him. And another another thing, and I've just connected dots on it. Yeah. Uh, I have no idea if it's true or not, but he's a Tennessee grad. Um, I've never asked 
Chris, but I would guess that he and Jimmy Sexton were probably in school at roughly the same time, mm. or at least have that connection, or there's a good rapport. Um, I'm not saying that's his full source on everything. A guy like that has multiple sources, well respected by everybody that he encounters in the business. But it's a pretty good source. Yeah. And background person to talk to in terms of background for all of this stuff that's in the story. It was very interesting. It was very telling. I think it showed just how torn Coat Saban was yeah. on whether the time was right, uh, whether uh, his love and respect for Alabama and his, his level of respect for Greg, that he could tell him a year out, you you might want to work on your list. Yeah. I remember a, a good friend of ours, Ray Mellick, uh, yeah. had talked about conversation he had with Mal Moore and that at any given time uh, a good athletic director has a list in his pocket of five head coaches for basketball football you name it mm -hmm. that if the hammer were to drop right they would know and uh, a it, wish list if nothing yeah, else yeah in in the article talks about you know burn and his group crunching numbers finding analytics where should they look um, but getting back to Saban so much of what the article reads is almost that he had become demoralized of the college athlete today mm -hmm. and talking about uh, he was talking about the vision of his program and he said to himself maybe this doesn't work anymore that the goals and aspirations are just different and that it's all about how much money can I make as a college player and I'm not saying that's bad I'm not saying it's wrong I'm just saying that's never been what we're all about and it's not why we had success through all these years right so it's not saying that he wasn't willing to change or he had begun the change. It's just maybe him seeing that the model that he had created that had been so successful was no longer going to work in today's college football. I, I totally see all of that. I agree with all that. Certainly, I believe that that's yeah. absolutely what he said, so I wouldn't doubt it for a second. Again, because I respect Chris Lowe and believe that all of that would be accurate in terms of the quotes and the thinking behind all of it. If the man who has shown the ability to be perhaps the most adaptive coach, mm -hmm. now the reason he's the best coach is because he had the ability to change a tire at 55 miles per hour, mm -hmm. 70 if he had to. Yeah. They're without any drop off. Mm -hmm. You know, you think of, uh, I keep going back to Coach Bryant because of the natural yeah. comparison. You know, the conversation, especially in Alabama, is the two best of all time. Coach Bryant knew he had to change and he changed offenses, but it took him basically two years of being six and five, being average, before he made that change and that was never to the wishbone. Saving. Nick Saban changed by bringing in Lane Kiffin, and he went from being really, really, really good to being really, really, really great. And I'll always believe that if Lane hadn't got a little cute on some things, Alabama wins three national titles okay. during that stretch. They may not have been in the position they were in to win them, mm -hmm. period, without the, the great coaching job that he did. But I thought the play call, uh, you know, if you just give the ball to Derrick Henry in the Sugar Bowl against Ohio State, you're going to play for and beat Oregon in the national championship just like Ohio State did. But he got cued on the play call, play action, and, and, and Blake, you know, threw the pick. But I remember vividly as the sideline reporter, Lane throwing his hands up, thought he had a touchdown. Blake thought he had a touchdown, but Ohio State knew what was coming. DB right. steps in front, picks it, preserves the lead. They win the ball game. Um, and then Lane, kind of being Lane on his way out the door on the back end, they win the, ch the title in his second year. And then the third year is when, um, from the movie Life, mm -hmm. you know, oh, yeah. Chris Tucker looks at, at Ice Cube and go, how are you going to get fired on your day off? Right. How are you going to get fired from a job you've already quit? That's what happened for That's Lane. That's the bus left. Because, yeah. you know, and if he had not created, I thought Sark did a great job under very tough circumstances. Mm -hmm. But it, I thought the volatility that Lane created made that an even tougher task 
of beating Clemson that it would have been otherwise. So that could have been two more titles. Yeah. That's why I've gotten off track, and I no, apologize. It's okay. But I think that's why that's a prime example of Nick Saban's ability to to have one philosophy, but understand I need to change some things. Mm-hmm. And Lane was phenomenal at calling plays, yeah. and his offense clearly was cutting edge, and it was the right move. But how many coaches would have done that? Well, and that's we talk about. We've talked about money, we've talked about guaranteed playing time, and another thing was assistance. He mm-hmm. got tired of constantly having to hire new assistants, and also assistants wanting, which understandably, the guarantee that, the he's, that Saban is going to stay there yeah. for a couple more years. And a quote he said was, uh, the thing I loved about coaching the most was the relationships that you had with players and coaches, and those things didn't seem to have the meaning as they once did. Right. Uh, especially with players now coming to a school for a year, right? And not coming because they've always wanted to play football for Alabama or Nick Saban, right? Um, again, and and Nick Saban was very transparent of, as we've said, if this is the way the game is, all right, we'll figure out a way to adapt right. and continue, but. I imagine that it would get exhausting. No doubt. And, and tired of. Yeah. This this one is different um, because of how it truly does impact recruiting and what the mindset of players, you know, when it was saying you couldn't have the face-to-face visits during a certain window, they just went to the Zoom. They, they did Zoom before COVID. Yeah. Okay, that's what he. They had heard of Zoom before COVID, uh, which the rest uh, of us had that's not. Right. So. And it, it may not have been Zoom. Exactly. It may have been FaceTime, but whatever it was, it was recruiting that way as opposed to mm-hmm. the face-to-face, and he made it work. I mean, it, to me, again, it goes back to Coach Bryant thinking of tearaway jerseys before anybody else did and forcing the NCAA to change a rule. Mm-hmm. And that's where he was. He was, okay, this is the rule. I'm not cheating. I'm going to go ahead and I'm, I'm going to find a way to get done what needs to be done uh, within the rule book. And so that was that was pretty special. But when it when there were ever things that he didn't agree with, we've talked about it. The hurry up, no huddle, you know, um, the RPO stuff. And he would literally ask in rules meetings and stuff, "Is this what we want college football to be?" Mm-hmm. And when the answer comes back yes, he go, "All right, hold my mm-hmm. beer," and he go do it as well or better than yeah. anybody else. I can do that. That ability to adapt was absolutely. Unbelievable, but it absolutely, I think, got to a point where he goes, "This is going to require a little bit more," and at this stage, I don't think I'm ready to do that. And you know, he was the one who said, "You know, when retirement creeps in, it's it's been time." Like when you begin to think about it, and he said he went down to Florida after losing um, in the semifinal game. And he and Miss Terry talked about it, reached mm-hmm. out to Bill Parcells, reached out to Gene Stallings, which I yeah. thought was interesting. It's great. Which, I mean, I've always said, the good Lord willing, I get to heaven. I think God sounds like Gene Stallings. Like, I, I love that voice. Um, Probably does, because Gene Stallings sounded like Coach Bryant. And yeah. Everybody thought that's. The, I just the always voice have thought, whenever too. I heard Gene Stallings talk, I'm like, that's just, oh. Uh. Yeah. Uh, and then Greg Byrne, reaching out to former players and not asking. Who, who should I hire, but what would you do if you're in my shoes? Reaching out to Namath, Mark yeah. Ingram, uh, Devontae, and uh, Jalen Hurts. Right. I, I said this to somebody last night. It's why Greg Byrne is the best at, yeah. at his job in the country. And he said he's sticking around. Thank God. I know. Um, we don't need, yeah, we, there's only so much we can handle. Yes, that's, and I, I, don't, I don't need that when no. you're on right now. Uh, <clears throat> I thought it was a phenomenal move to at least, and I'm not saying he didn't take all that into consideration, but what a great move to involve people over multiple generations right, yeah. in history of Alabama football to make them feel part of the process. Mm-hmm whether it factored in his thinking at all. I think the man knew who the two guys were. Yeah. From the start, which Chris Lowe Lowe talked about, and how could you argue with either one? But 
interesting though because Jimmy Sexton does represent so many coaches. This was a boon for college coaches of renegotiating sure. their deals, being having their name at least mentioned or included in this search process in a quick amount of time. Right. Or, you know, throwing it out and, and here's the thing, it's funny, on an infinitely smaller level, um, I've been a part of helping coaches get their name in the media mm -hmm. since back in my college days. There were some relationships that I had that um, jobs were open, names maybe were mentioned, and somebody four spots removed may have had a conversation with somebody that I knew. And I may have let somebody that I know mm -hmm. in the media, hey, I know for a fact, yeah. A, B, or C took place. Um, is it manipulating the system? No, it's factual. That doesn't mean that they're going to get a job, mm -hmm. but it certainly helps the situation. And even if you don't leave, it can raise your profile personally but also of your program, depending right. on the situation. Now, Washington didn't need their profile raised. No. Uh, Alabama certainly doesn't need theirs. But I did think, to me, as I'll say not just as a broadcaster, but as a fan of Alabama, how exciting it is that you, you didn't have to go down the line. You didn't have to get rejected multiple times. Mm -hmm. You didn't have to wonder and go, uh-oh. Greg Burns telling the players to their face, and I know the man, he doesn't tell you something if he doesn't think he can back it up. Yeah, He's not going to lie to your face. I've, him, never, I've mm -hmm. never encountered that to him, with, with him whatsoever. And guaranteeing the players that within 72 hours they tell would have them a new 70, head coach. And, and what all is involved with that? especially when you go back and think, and I know circumstances are different, 17 years may as well be 170 years oh, in certain areas uh, of where we are in the world and well, especially for a, communication a teenager, and all that. Yeah. yeah, but you think about how long it took to go from Mike Shula has been fired, Joe Kynes is the interim, to finally at the podium, there's Nick Saban. Mm -hmm. And that is just uh, amazing to me that Kalen DeBoer could be coaching the national championship game on Monday and then be named the head coach at a school that the casual fan, based on a one-year sample size, mm -hmm. is parallel to Alabama. Yeah. But what it also tells me Alabama's not parallel to many programs at all. No, and, I, and Kalen DeBoer They're even said it. that when he addressed the players for the first time. He yep. was like, this isn't just anywhere. This and, place is special. And you think it gutted Washington players and fans? What if Mike Norvell had left Florida State, who had just gotten left out mm -hmm. going 13-0, and 0, yeah. to Have go you, take over at Alabama, who their fan base believes Pretty much got yeah. their spot. Exactly. And make no, here's what it also told me. There ain't no doubt Mike Norvell would have taken that job oh, if gosh. it was offered. But what's interesting is DeBoer saying, I couldn't say no to the challenge. Because De yeah. Byrne directly asked him about, you know, the question we all ask of following the guy. You know, the old adage is you don't want to be the one who follows the guy, you want to be the one who follows and follows the guy. Great answer. And DeBoer said, I, I can't say no to the challenge. And he wanted to be that guy. Right. And, you know, I, it, we're in a different day and age than necessarily when you had to follow Bear Bryant. Mm -hmm. uh, college coach, and I, I'm not saying college coaches had the same swagger or did not have the same swagger back then, but you walk in with a lot of presence. The world is a lot bigger right now. And um, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> Look, you know, my my wins and losses are not determined. Uh, you know, Kalen DeBoer, people look at a scoreboard and determine whether he followed yeah. a legend well. Mine will be simply a matter of public opinion. 
And frankly, uh, I need Kalen DeBoer to win ball games because it's amazing over the years how much better people think I am at doing play-by-play well, -play yeah. when my team wins. You know, they're not replaying. They're not replaying a ton of highlights from NIT seasons. No, but okay, but I do want me. to, while we're pulling back the curtain, you were saying this off camera, and I hope you don't mind me sh uh, sharing the story of on Saturday this past week, you went yeah. to college game day because it was the first time ever broadcasting from Coleman Coliseum for basketball. Right. And you went down because you know Reese Davis and wanted yeah. to say hi, and you said he was talking to Coach DeBoer. Right. And. <laughs> you wanted to go up because the last time you had seen Coach DeBoer was the coronation, the whirlwind day. The when, yeah, it's not a press conference; it's a coronation. And I'm, I'll be amazed if he remembers probably ten people from oh, that day. No doubt. Um, I, I literally spent thirty seconds talking to him before we went upstairs. It was actually in the recruiting room, and yeah. I'd, I'd spent probably more time talking with Coach Saban that day about Which is nothing yeah. but. Hitting life, golf balls and life, life and, and yeah. we did. We, you know, taught hitting golf balls and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, and then I, then Greg introduced me to Coach DeBoer, and and it was a thirty second conversation before we went up and the press conference took place. And I had given him my card that day, and you're right. Saturday I had been at game day with Reese, and then later that night at the game itself, mm -hmm. Reese had stayed in town, Bama grad, as most people know, and. Uh, stuck around to enjoy the game. Yeah, he, he the looked game. great being as a fan oh, yeah. when, they, when they cut to him. Just It was awesome. And, and clearly it was great for him professionally. Yeah. Great, he could easily justify it because he did hang out with Kalen DeBoer a little yeah. bit. They sat and watched the game together. He hung out with Jalen Milrow a little bit and got to see a lot of people. So it was, it was a working, enjoyable visit yeah. for, for Reese. But as I w had finished doing the the portion of the pregame that we do from the lobby of mm -hmm. Coleman Coliseum, I went down and I was about to go courtside and as I go through this portal I look and I see Coach DeBoer and Reese standing there talking and I didn't want to walk up and get in the way but I did want to say hello to him. It was the first time I've seen him since the press conference. Yeah. It was the first time I would have a chance to see him since I'd been Named yeah. the play-by-play -play guy for football. He's been football. to basketball games, so you're kind of busy, typically. Yeah, typically so. Mm -hmm. So um, I just kind of stepped in there, and then Josh Maxson, who's the, as you know, the the football communications guy, and uh, I said, hey, how about reintroducing me to Coach, because I know he doesn't remember, mm -hmm. just like you were saying. He goes, yeah, no problem. So he, he steps in at, a, at an appropriate time and, and kind of interrupts, and he goes, you know, I knew Reese wouldn't mind. <laughs> Uh, and he goes, hey, coach. He goes, you know, Chris Stewart does your TV show, and <laughs> this, and now you're play by yeah. play. He goes, yeah, hey, Chris, good to see you. And talk for just a second. Again, it wasn't a, it wasn't more than a 90 second conversation then, yeah. but it was an actual yeah. visit conversation. I gave him another card. Didn't think anything about it. I said, if anything you need, let me know. I said, I know you won't need me, but if anything you need, let me know. He said, no, I appreciate it, and uh, come see us at practice. Thought great. Um, I'm sitting at church the next day. My phone beeps, and sadly, I admit that I checked my phone with mm -hmm. it beeping, and I looked, and it was a text message from Kalen DeBoer. And uh, it was simple, you know. Good to see you yesterday. Hope to see you at practice. You know, anything? Let me know. And uh, thought, wow. And full disclosure, <laughs> I waited until church was over before I replied. <laughs> But I, uh, sitting there going, what do I, say? <laughs> I didn't say I wasn't doing that, no, but I I'm waited like, until mm. church was over before I replied. Yeah. Dear Lord. All, I, all that means is that, um, you know, different time, different way yeah, it of is. doing things doesn't mean it's better, doesn't mean it wor definitely doesn't mean it's worse. No. But it's just different. And, um, you know, certainly I'm in a different spot than I was. But. It, you, when when you're next, mm -hmm. and you are following somebody that has legendary status, I I can relate, in a, on a different scale, uh, different profession, but I can relate. And here's the thing, <laughs> as I kind of joked a few minutes ago, my success or failure <laughs> will be partially judged. Mm -hmm. That's not 
entirely. Mm. Okay. You know, man's great. Yeah. Eli Gold, great career, and had the privilege of broadcasting Gene Stallings mm. and and All Nick, the way Saban. Nick Saban. But he also had he also had Bill Curry. He also had yeah. Mike Shula. No disrespect to either no. of those men. Um, you know, Dennis Franchoni. Yeah, there were some and, stinkers uh, in there. Did a spring game with with Mike Price. Yeah, none of that was Eli's fault. No, you know, but people do have a tendency to want to shoot the messenger. Yeah, but he also called some national championships. And that's so, what I'm saying. Yeah, you know, he, he called Stallings. He called seven. Yeah, national titles, six with Saban yeah. and one with Coach Stallings. So, um, and again, Eli is a Hall of Fame broadcaster. In all likelihood whether Alabama wins or not, but you are little stuff people don't think about. I, I've just noticed this over the years. They don't run your highlights on Sports Center on radio if your team's not in the top twenty five. No, unless don't. it's a fluke right. game, a fluke, you know, a crazy finish or something like that. Um, my calls were heard a whole lot more last year when Alabama was the number one national seed yeah. going into the NCAA tournament. Yeah. My calls are heard more and watched more uh, because of what they tie in on the, the social media stuff. If we win, yeah. it's just a different animal, different thing entirely. And or unless you throw in like a hobnailed boot, kind of that unless one. Unless you're doing Munson Ooh. and you're, you know, golly, he just, was so good. He was good. Really, he was uh, so good. But you did mention we've got spring practice that started this week. We'll we're gonna we'll cycle into that. And um, Coach DeBoard said, "Stop by practice sometime." Had you ever gone to practice with Coach Saban? A couple of times, not a lot. Because I didn't know, especially going into spring ball, you'll call the spring game on the thirteenth of next month. I didn't know yeah, I'll how go you for developed that. any familiarity with. Most, uh, you know, I had access on occasion to watch film. Yeah. You know, and you can do it that way. Um, I find a lot of people in my profession do things in order to talk about what they've done. Yeah. And it may or may not serve any real purpose. Gotcha. They like to, you know, talk about all that they did and how long they spent on their their charts. I didn't know. Just every, it's something. It's everybody has something different that works do. for them. And they so do exactly if, right. Yeah. And I've learned over the years what I really need to do yeah. in order to do my job the best I can. And uh, yeah, I definitely want to see. I definitely want to see practice, but didn't see a lot under Coach Saban's yeah. during Coach Saban's time, because for what I was doing, frankly, it wasn't, it wasn't necessary. Relevant. Yeah. And I didn't want to be. I, I, I never wanted to be in the way, right? Unless what I was doing actually served a purpose. Well, because back in the old days, back when I was out there. All practices were open for the most part. Right. Uh, Bowden and Tuberville and everybody, Auburn, you could go watch whatever you wanted to. But under Dubos and those folks. Come well, you had to be there because your competition was there. Yeah. So, and for people who think practice is interesting, practice is extremely boring for the most Unless part. Unless somebody gets hurt. And it's, then they're not telling you exactly. Exactly. But uh, but Coach DeBoer has opened media windows to be for media to be able to come back and watch, I think, maybe... Wednesday was like the first nine periods of practice was the right. media window that they could go and watch. And, you know, of course, all eyes, you know, Jalen was QB1 because mm -hmm. somebody has to be QB1. Sure. Um, was that a shock? I mean, it couldn't have been a shock to anybody. I, I, you know, I think people were maybe looking at, you know, Austin Mack or some of these other guys. But I think with Austin Mack, and I, I heard Brock Heward talking on the next round, you know, it's going to be good competition. It's mm -hmm. going to be someone who, you know, I think you want QB1 maybe to just, Especially with installation of a new system, um, having somebody behind you is good. Yeah. In some ways, um, but you know, with with practice starting, I think we've had two practices, and it's been lot, largely just figuring out where you go for each. Right. The next period, and just pretty much, I think they'd said they'd gone over the routines, but it is. It's a different practice system. I can't they, imagine. They're learning. You yeah. know, and with with Womack, he's installing his defense. But I do think it was interesting to hear that he and Saban sat down last month and swapped notes. Learned. I learned. Let me tell you what. I learned so much with the next round and what they did when the guys did from that Tuscaloosa. That was a great broadcast last oh, week. Oh, it was phenomenal. I, I mean, it I was, only wish they could have gone with a camera live around to show the rest of us what that building yeah. looks like. They they described it in great detail, but. In, Go it back and watch it if you haven't seen it. It was last right. Wednesday. They and, were live. And guys were building. candid with them and and open uh, 
about things. I thought that they did a fantastic yeah, job. Yeah, they had with Greg it. Byrne, they had uh, Womack, they had uh, Sheridan, and yes. then finished with DeBoer. They did, and it was they were all great. Yeah. And uh, you could tell they all wanted to be at Alabama. Yeah. You could also tell they were not overwhelmed by being at Alabama, uh, but they each gave up something in terms of security. Mm -hmm to be at the University of Alabama. Now look, I know you're compensated extremely well, but they were also compensated well other spots. Right. Kane Womack walks away from a head coaching job. That's not an easy one to get. Mm -mm. To, be a, to be a coordinator, um, as we said, a move cross country uh, to a place that he hasn't lived before with Sheridan. the highest of expectations. Well, and with Sheridan, he had been the tight ends coach. So right. the elevation from where he was Two months ago. Even though he'd been a coordinator before. Right. But, but you're right, it's a change. It's a big it's a change. Lot. It's a lot to come on your plate suddenly within two months. But those guys were, I think, really candid. It was it was very uh, insightful. Mm -hmm. uh, but you gotta also remember, you know, this guy's <clears throat> this guy's really smart and they're they're gonna show what they wanna show when they wanna show it. Mm -hmm. And again I'll go back one last time in this show to Coach Bryant. The spring, no, the summer, leading into fall practice, which was basically fall practice, mm -hmm. the old Skyriders tour. They come in, I've, and media's checking out practice. And Alabama's running that I formation, that old set that they had been six and five mm -hmm. with two previous years, and they looked pretty average. <laughs> You're running that stuff, and then everybody packs up and leaves. They check around, realize everybody's gone, and then they go and they go mm -hmm. back to running the wishbone, which he had secretly installed. Yeah. That off season, actually, if I'm not mistaken, he installed it between the the, the end of spring and the start of fall practice. Mm -hmm. So, and they kept it quiet. They unleashed the bone against USC in the season opener that year in Los Angeles, pulled off an upset win, and that turned the corner to what, of course, became the 78-79 national championship seasons. So, again, Coach Bryant gave access, mm -hmm. but sometimes giving access is part of your plan. Yeah. And it's, it's not naivete, it's, it's not showing too much, sometimes it's, it's using the uh, the this outlet yeah. to uh, to show exactly what you want shown. Oh yeah, so I remember. We'll I remember a coach one time. I'm not going to even say which coach. We were talking about just coming and watching practice. I think it was maybe we were at a bowl game and the opposing team was not letting us come to practice. And the coach was like, "Do you think anybody's going to be able to tell anything about what we're doing here?" He's like, "We're not going to show y'all anything while y'all are here." Sure. I was like, "Yeah, that's right." I know. A lot of stretching. And, and the difference, I don't think Coach Saban was paranoid about, you know, somebody getting it's secrets anything, or whatever. technology. He didn't want distractions. It's true, yeah. He didn't want distractions. When you got other people walking around that aren't, you know, invited or exactly where they're supposed to be, whatever. Well, every, it's just more, dis it's, it's more to distract from what's the task at hand, yeah. which is getting better that day in right. practice. And that because every moment of his is calculated, every moment of his is curated as to what's be going, what's going to be doing. And quickly before we finish that up, that was one of the other things that uh, he got really discouraged about with players is that in the meetings after the bowl game, instead of what can I do to get better next yeah. year, it was how much playing time you're going to guarantee me before I put my name in the portal, and how much, how much money, pay me. how much money you're going to pay me, and. Yeah. You know, that's. I think that was a big change. Yeah. I think that, and that, and that goes back to the demoralizing of it, where he's right. just like, I don't know if I can continue to do this because right. they, they, I think you need you need players with the same vision as the coaching staff, yeah. and that's it, just not what it was anymore. Well, and he'd always sold to players. How many times we hear him say, "Creating value for yourself and creating value for the NFL," which is where the real money yeah. is. You know, it's like he had that com famous conversation with Rolando McLean after Rolando had gotten in trouble. Uh, somebody had said something, and and Rolando went after him, and coach brought him into the office, and and he said, you know, you can't do that. And he said Rolando basically stood up and 
and pounded the desk, not mad at Coach, but mad at the situation that had been created. And he goes, Coach, where I come from, you don't sit, you know, you can't let somebody talk about you. You can't let this. And he goes, well, I know I understand, and I respect you feeling that way. But let me just be honest with you and lay something out. Here's what the dollar amount is for a first-round draft pick. Here's the guaranteed money for a first-round draft pick. If you go in the second round or later, this is the highest you can possibly make, and it will be in your next contract. This is the max that you can make, and it was a fraction of what you could make on the very first guaranteed contract, whether you ever play a snap mm -hmm. or not. And he told, he laid that for Rolando. He goes, so what's more valuable to you? Yeah. And Rolando <laughs> said, Coach, you'll never have another problem with me again. But it's somebody being honest and right. also believing in him and knowing you have that capability and that right. talent. And if you follow my process and my plan, I will get you there. Right. So. Um, and if, good Lord, if Adam and Eve will eat that fruit with God himself telling them not to, surely to goodness an 18-year-old kid's going to take the going to take the fruit from uh, another coach that's going to lie to him. Anytime. Okay, I promised we would get around to this, but Alabama basketball, they have dropped two conference games in a row for the first time in two years. Uh, Saturday against Tennessee was disappointing because mm -hmm. I felt like that was a winnable game. Winnable game, all the atmosphere, all the excitement, but understandable it was Understand Tennessee. Tennessee, I think arguably should be a number one seed going into this tournament. I know the projections no don't always have them there, uh, but having watched them play, particularly on the road, they don't quit. They, no. uh, they are a talented, talented basketball team, and as they showed, uh, beating South Carolina on the road as well. Um, the only hesitation I think anybody has that's doing a projection of Tennessee as a one seed, and I have great respect for the man, so I'm not taking a shot when I say this, but I think there's always doubt of a Rick Barnes team. I know. Getting beyond the Sweet 16. Oh, because how I many years think, do I pencil them in and yeah. then I sit there and I hem and haw over it and I go with them? Yeah, and again, it, I know how tough it is to win, period. Um, you know, he's been to a Final Four, but they say only one, and I, I remind people all the time, how if you're doing them out, to? if well, if you're doing them out, Rushmore of coaches in the last 50 years, Dean Smith is going to be on that list, but at the same time, Dean Smith won two national championships, and the only reason his teams won those two national titles, you could argue, is because the other side did something incredibly stupid in the last seconds of the game. Good point. The, the throwaway in the Georgetown mm -hmm. game that hit J James Worthy in the mm -hmm. chest, and, uh, then? and then the Chris Weber timeout when they didn't have one. Who will that's, that's the greatest coach. That's, that's yeah. one of the greatest coaches in the last 50 years in college basketball. And he, he really only has those two titles because somebody else messed up. So my point is the end, of, uh, the end of the run may not have been great for Rick Barnes, but he's as good as there's been in, in college coaching and has a, a great Tennessee team. But I think that's the only reason that they're not talked about as yeah. a slam dunk Final Four is because people have doubts about one of his teams being able to get back there. And we talk about Tennessee and how they, they won that game. I'm not going to say they, they, they won the game, I'm not going to say because Alabama, it's almost as if they are so focused on trying to play defense and they're not doing that well either that it's affecting the offense. Yeah. Uh, the threes are missing. Guys are fouling out. We've got, yeah. what, 40, how many trips to the line? I don't even know how many times you must have said that it in the broadcast on Tuesday yeah. uh, down but in Gainesville. And Florida earned it. It's not like they it was did. a bad whistle, really. Uh, you know, a couple, but you're always going to have that. I think. I mean, what do you what see from your eyes there? Yeah, Tennessee is so good defensively, and to do it against Alabama and <laughs> South Carolina. Mm -hmm two really good offensive teams. In their houses. And in their houses, locked them both down. It was phenomenal effort in both ball games. Yes, Alabama missed some open looks, a bunch of them. Uh, I'm not making excuse, it's just a fact. I think they're tired right now. The, the loss 
it, it's twofold. And the Latrell announcers all Reitzel, called them tired the other yeah, night. Look, I have no problem saying it. I think they are. Latrell Reitzel's absence because of the injury yeah. has has changed the backcourt rotation and the ability, the inability to defend without fouling in the post and totally messing that rotation up among the bigs. It's a twofold thing that's forced a limited number of guys to play a ton of minutes. Did Nelson fall out. out in back-to-back games? Yeah, I think yeah. so. And it's not like he had big numbers in either one. No. It's, you know, it's not like he had 15 and 8 when he fouled out. No. Um, you know, he got himself in foul trouble uh, and then, you know, was never able to be the factor that Alabama needs desperately him needs him yeah. to be. You know, he doesn't have to go for 20 and 10 every game, but he can't foul out with the numbers that he had. No, and then even, you know, Mark Sears uh, finished with, what, 33 or something yeah. against Florida, but so many of those were in mop-up minutes. And I'm not saying Florida was not playing tight defense no. and he didn't earn those. It was... But it was not a one-possession game. game. The game had gotten out of hand at that point. Uh, because totally agree. it becomes a question, I'm not going to say of leadership, but is somebody willing to slam the, the, the locker room door closed and say... It's, I know what you're saying, but I don't know that it requires that. I, I think that's it's, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think it's that. I think they've got to get... I think this. the bad thing for them in the game against Florida was that they had to turn around after a tough, right. exhausting, emotional loss on short to see on short rest. The uh, And you can make the same argument for Florida. Mm -hmm. Although they were at home senior day, so you got a little extra juice for that. The the plus is that playing that early game, they now get an extra day, which yeah. they desperately need coming home and play in Arkansas. I mean, they got, I know because I was on the plane with them, we got back to Tuscaloosa at midnight. Um, Tuesday night. Tuesday, yeah, Tuesday night, late. I don't know this to be fact, but I, I would doubt they did anything other than look at film on Wednesday. It was probably a light day uh, today, scheduled yeah. on Thursday. Um, I'll see Nate in just a little while when I go do his TV show. But, you know, Friday they'll, they'll Shoot around, do a little more, get around you know, Arkansas. more game plan stuff and then get ready and it's an early tip yeah. against the Hogs. So I, I think they wants to make sure they're sharp again, but I think they, get a couple they days need rest, rest. Yeah, yeah, after before you go Saturday. to the tournament and hopefully a Friday. You know, your top four seed, <laughs> and you don't have to play again until Friday. Yeah, I'll be very surprised if whatever version of Alabama we see on Saturday against Arkansas, if it's not a much much better version on Friday, hopefully Friday when yeah. they play their first game in the tournament. Rylan Griffin, his status is going to be huge in that. Uh, calf injury, they called it, on Tuesday night. Mm -hmm. I don't know how things went with an MRI on Wednesday, but I know they were going to have it. If that is a strain, that could be a little bit lengthier uh, time in getting out. If it's just a bruise, that's a different story. And you can probably treat that and get them ready even to go on Saturday. But that's, uh, that's a concern. I think Latrell Reitzel is getting better. <laughs> and he'll play more minutes on Saturday, assuming there haven't been any setbacks from yeah. the head injury. I think you will see him uh, play more on Saturday, and obviously they need him whether Reitzel is injured uh, and unavailable or not. Bottom line is this is not how you want to be playing basketball. You don't want to limp into March. Heading into this part of the season. No, nope, you don't. And it's disappointing because prior to Reitzel's injury, I thought this team was really trending. Yeah the right way and it shows you how quickly one week can change the conversation the dynamic i know people have not given up on them no, though, because no, no, they no, still continue they. to throw this could be a sweet 16 team if they get on a run and however if they get the wrong matchup in that initial weekend but that's everybody oh true that, no you're right everybody. you're absolutely right but right now if they can get healthy then i still i you know i felt before that this team was trending towards one that nobody wanted to face in the tournament they can still be that, but they've taken a step back. I thought they were going to have, I thought they would have a championship in their hip pocket yeah. by the time we got there because the way they were playing, where they were in the standings, I thought they were going to be very tough to knock off that perch. And you hope that Oates maybe feeds off that of like, guys, just people thought that we were yeah. going to have a share of that championship. That's not happening anymore. He's so you honest, know what? He's honest and open with his team about yeah. stuff, pro and con. Uh, 
and I have no doubt that's that's part of the conversation. And I know that you really want to beat Arkansas on Saturday. I would thoroughly enjoy a victory over the Hawks. Yeah. I'll I leave know. it at that. I'm trying okay. to be nice. I know. I know. It's personal. Not really personal, but I still, personally. I, I, I will say it's not personal. But yet, personally, I would love to see I know, Alabama Sometime beat we'll Arkansas. get to the bottom of that, too. But uh, yeah, Alabama tips off against Arkansas at 11 o'clock on Saturday morning from Coleman Coliseum. Um, and then after that, we will wait and see seeding for the SEC tournament, which begins yeah. a week from today in Nashville. Yeah, on Saturday night, we'll know, and uh, we'll, get a, we'll get another podcast knocked out. We'll have a I preview know. of it. And Hopefully talking good stuff. And we've got more football coming up, too. So sure uh, I think they practice again tomorrow, this being Thursday. Do they have three practices this week? Or? Uh, I should know that, okay. but I don't yet. I should know part, too. And frankly, part of it is now that I can go to practice, I've got to start looking at the schedule, so yeah. I do. I know. But uh, not something I've had to worry about in the past, but and I will we'll have, now. And we'll have baseball coming up, too, so we have... Uh, Baseball's doing well. I know. Baseball's one of the top teams in the country. Only loss was to a top 15 team in extra innings in Dallas Baptist uh, in a tournament in Frisco. Do you know that's the one their team? game yesterday. I, I walked into our Mexican restaurant we go to, and it was, this was last year, and I looked up the TV, and it was DB, and I was like... DB. Yeah. And I typically, that's kind of like, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a savant about like schools and mascots. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yep. it Dallas took me Baptist. a good five minutes. And then I was like. Dallas Baptist is what Birmingham Southern could have been if they'd not had an idiot president replace Neil Birdie. Yeah. If they hadn't brought that idiot in to replace Neil Birdie and destroy so much of that campus and that athletic department, that, yep. take them from D1 to that to it D3, so hard. But, yep. but if Brian Shoup had, had, if everything had been left alone by that clown, this, and I don't know if you can tell how I feel about him or not. Kind of like Arkansas. But uh, this one's, that one, this one's personal. This one's personal, yeah. I know, I, I know. At Birmingham but Southern we know, and, and we know these the people, yes. Yeah, but that clown who was gone with the wind had not destroyed so much in his wake. Mm -hmm. um, Birmingham Southern baseball, I have no doubt. Scorched earth be, is when he left. Yep. Yeah, would be what Dallas Baptist is and <clears throat> what Winthrop was 15 yeah. years ago. Yep, yep, yep. I think with Dwayne Rebold as coach, Birmingham Southern would be now. The, the small mid-major uh, that nobody wanted to face. Speaking of which, Samford, you want to talk uh, about a team no one wants to face. Dwayne Rebold prodigy and yep. Bucky McMillan. And they are really, really good. I know. It's going to be interesting to see how long they can hold on I to I don't want to see them in my bracket, I'll um, tell you that. Nope, nobody Pull does. Pull for them, but I don't want to see them in my bracket. Nobody does. Okay, so we can always find you at chrisstewart.online. Oh, great memory. Nice job. Crushing it. I'm so man. proud of that. chrisstewart.online, as well as Saturday at Coleman Coliseum. We can listen to you. And uh, what time do you get on the air? We will go on the air at 10 a.m. I'll have a biscuit in my left hand, a cup of coffee in my right, and a headset on my ears. There you go. Uh, we need to thank Scott Forrester for oh, not man. only hustling, for getting us on, like, for getting this all together. A big thank you to Scott Forrester, as well as everybody at Double Down Media and Disrupt the Media. Uh, the next round, guys, always you can catch them every single day, pretty much anytime you want. I feel like someone's here They're always at working. any given hour, but check them out at next round. And for Chris Stewart, who is the voice of Alabama, I'm Kelly Hunter, and before we leave, we need a roll tie. Take care. I'll see you next week.